audience that are here once again with us in the fifth of these virtual series. And uh, I'm really most grateful to Zero Carbon Admin team for Zia Asad Khan, Salman Malik, and Umar Iqbal for your diligent efforts to keep this activity going. And it is wonderful that we have our co-founder of, of uh, Admin, Murad Jamil, with us again as he places his research activities on hold. Uh, he, as you know, he was not there for the last two sessions because he was busy uh, working on his research. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, we have uh, Arif Chengeri, the president of IUT here with us as well. And of course, uh, you know, I would like to really welcome our you know, two distinguished panelists today. I don't know whether John has been able to join so far or not yet. We should see. I'm so, going to. Uh, just to say, but of course you've uh, you've uh, heard the uh, uh, the CV or um, introduction to Professor Fozia Qureshi. She's uh, the North Chair of Ecomos in Pakistan, and has worn multiple celebrated hats as a consultant, an academic, and a conservationist. Now, my association with Fozia Qureshi goes back to the early 2000s when I worked as UNESCO's National Advisor for Lahore Port World Heritage, and collaborated with several eminent experts handpicked by that wonderful UNESCO director, Ingeborg Bryanus. I'd like to remember her today, who during her tenure protected Pakistan's heritage as no other. And I know that uh, Professor John Darlington is not, has not been able to join us because there's some glitch, I think, in technology. But uh, he, he has this wide-ranging experience and most importantly, one who's a great friend of Pakistan. John helped bring Makli and Pakistan's heritage center stage when, the, he, when he organized a distinguished gathering of heritage lovers last Friday in London to discuss strategies to take up Pakistan heritage sites, particularly Makli World Heritage. I'm most grateful to John for that. So thank you, Fozia and John, for uh, actively participating also in the Interval Pakistan uh, conference last November, which was held at ZC3 at Makli, uh, which made the event so fulfilling. Um, now, the last four lectures, as you know, were devoted to barefoot social architecture of Baza to establish the necessity of working with marginalized communities in order to fulfill their primary needs, along with discussion regarding judicious use of resources, relying on locally sourced materials and developing capacities of communities in co-building and co-creation. As I've expressed earlier, in my human humanitarian architecture, heritage has always played a critical role in our design, uh, that what we do for humanitarian work. Similarly, as I explained earlier, the, the learnings from humanitarian architecture have been equally valuable in working out strategies for conserving heritage. And today I'd like to uh, present to you as to how I think that is, that is possible and can be done. Now, I've always felt that architects and LDCs, that's the less developed, developed countries, have been hesitant about accepting their role in the protection and safeguarding of heritage. Yes, they go on marches. Yes, they do some documentation. Yes, they do uh, talk about it, but they don't really get involved. And I feel that, you know, they can play such a critical role in uh, ensuring the protection of this vast heritage that many of the LDCs actually hold. And uh, I, I wanted to bring this specially to your notice. I know that we have a, a large number of architects in the audience, and especially the young architects. I would very much like them to consider how to build up their own capacity to be able to uh, take part in heritage safeguarding. Now, I feel that in the in the fight, uh, in the light of the light of COVID nineteen, there is also a great concern. Since due to the economic downturn, heritage and culture will be the worst casualties. Even as the heritage sector always suffered from, the, from lack of resources earlier and allocation of funds, this situation is likely to be even further aggravated. I believe that more than ever before, we need to develop strategies to involve communities in heritage safeguard. It is true that some heritage sites of extremely high heritage value may require specialists to handle various conservation aspects but on the other hand, in countries such as Pakistan, it is essential that more and more architects develop the necessary know-how to be able to provide essential protection and help save a majority of heritage structures in collaboration with communities. Now, uh, there's a whole, as you know, there's not only the monuments on site, but there's a whole reservoir of urban heritage belonging to 19th and early 20th century, which is crying for help for being taken up for adaptive reuse 
Now, I know problem, a problem of funding always, and uh, there are issues, but I think we have to find a way, and perhaps uh, uh, IEP can really now start you know, giving some attention to, as to how funding can be raised even for heritage buildings. So today I wanted to share with you our work at Makli World Heritage and the factors that helped us to engage communities with the site. The second segment I would like to discuss is how ADMAN could provide assistance to crumbling heritage by using LEPI, or what I call Lari Emergency Preventive Intervention, that I devised to provide necessary first aid, which would buy time for many of our endangered and vulnerable sites. So uh, I'd like to begin with Makli World Heritage site, the largest Muslim necropolis in the world. For us, the association, for it goes back to the late 1980s, when my husband, historian Suhail Zahir Lari, began to photograph its various monuments. The site is a rare combination of dazzling, tangible, and intangible cultural heritage spanning over four centuries that comprises remains of mausoleums of rulers and saints in varying state of degradation and over two dozen Sufi shrines. You see the map on the left, uh, which is the um, map of Makli, of course. On the right is an aerial view, and so you can get an idea as to what the site looks like. Now, it is a, a, a sanctuary of peace. Its enchanted air of spiritualism is all-pervading, and a site which for centuries has propagated the message of uh, tolerance among all faiths. The shrines attract hundreds of thousands of devotees, and not surprisingly, they also draw hundreds of beggars seeking alms. It is these mendicant communities, and particularly women, that became the focus of our attention last lectures also. Now, after 2010 floods, when news flashed across regarding climate migrants crowding the World Heritage Makli necropolis, assistance to one monument. Upon, up to that time, there had been no record of the condition of the monuments, and I felt that we should have to carry out studies of all the monuments before anyone could be taken up. And this is the document that you see the cover on the left, which we developed at the time, and a couple of pages from inside. So Deborah Stock, who later became a, a dear friend actually, told me that they had 35,000 euros for conservation, but only 5,000 for any studies. This is how the first pictorial inventory of Makli came about. I mean, you'd be surprised that there has been no proper inventory of, of Makli itself. So for the first time, it drew attention to the tragic state of Makli world heritage and became the basis for taking up further work by ourselves, as well as the government departments. And I wanted to bring it to you that that is why it is so important to start to really have inventories for all heritage assets all over Pakistan. Now, there has been much discussion recently among architects regarding loss of heritage, which is largely due to lack of, I feel, of, of inventories, because nobody knows where these uh, assets are. So for me, inter these inventories are critical, as we know from the cataloging of 600 heritage buildings of Karachi that Heritage Foundation conducted in the early 1990s and notified them in 1994 under special urban heritage pre preservation legislation that saved them from being pulled down. And unfortunately, uh, there has not been funding enough for them to be uh, conserved, but at least they're still standing. And uh, uh, I mean, sometimes overnight, of course, somebody does come and demolish, but by and large, they are, they are being able to save them. So uh, the, Mercury, the Prince Cloud Fund document led to more detailed survey that we carried out, resulting in the first catalog with detailed numbering of each monument. The exact location along with, and you can see this catalog, with uh, all the coordinates are there, the numbering system is there. So uh, we were able to then prepare detailed map demarketing the core and buffer zones for the first time in 2012. That's a map that I showed, the first slide that we showed you. And uh, this work served the site, saved the site from being placed on UNESCO's endangered sites. Now, another important document that we developed during this time was the National Register of Historic Places of Pakistan, of Makli, I'm sorry, which is part of Historic Places of Pakistan. We've done several others as well. Such documents are uh, uh, the norm in uh, uh, most countries, but sadly missing in Pakistan. So these, you can see how many um, uh, of these uh, sites and then going on to Arwan period in the middle and Tarkhan period uh, on the right. And then uh, uh, there are some develop our map. 
So the register uh, that we developed that provides the numbering, coordinate, state of damage, short history, and description of 75 above ground uh, surviving monuments. If you go to the next slide, we will be able to see that as well, uh, because that's a, that is a national register. Uh, sorry, these are the monuments that we, that we are cataloged. So you can see there are lots of them, 75 uh, number actually. And in the next slide uh, comes the national register and uh, how that was laid out, you can see, because that has all the details then. You can see that you, there are three monuments that, that are being shown here with their um, footprint, the planned footprint, with the information, historic information, a little bit about description about what they are, what their status is, and, and so on. And that actually becomes a document on the basis of which you can develop further. So we found that there were, as I said, 75 above ground surviving monuments. There were 402 platforms, 452 carved uh, stone graves, and 3,000 plus rubble graves. This is the order of the number of, of heritage assets that uh, Makli actually contains. Now, in the next slide, you'll be able to see that from 2012, uh, 12, we have been able to conserve several monuments. Um, and then uh, you can see on the left, there's a tomb of someone noble one with Prince Klaus Fund, the, the funding that they finally they gave us after we've done the uh, that document, um, uh, the damage assessment document. Uh, on the left below is a 15th century Al Hasabi Mosque with spiritual courts out of South Africa. Then uh, next, the, on, on, on the top is a 15th century tomb of Mirza Jan Baba, which was done with, uh, 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 with conserved with German uh, government funding. And uh, below that is the tomb of Amir Sultan Muhammad, and uh, uh, that was done with the uh, US Ambassador's Fund. Uh, then we have the tomb of Munir Mahfouri, again with Prince Ch uh, Klaus Fund. Uh, the, the tomb of uh, Khusro Charkhas, also with the uh, Prince Klaus Fund and the Heritage Fund Foundation funding. And on the right is the tomb of Sultan Ibrahim with U.S. Ambassador's Fund. So this is all. This all came about after that particular document was available, and we were able to look at it, and everybody could see where the need was, and accordingly, uh, these monuments have been taken up and and conserved. Now, uh, I wanted to present to you today um, the conservation of the Tomb of Sultan Ibrahim monument, which gave the greatest impetus to our work with communities because of the ancient craft of Kashi. Kashi, of course, as you know, is glazed tiles. I mean, Lahore is famous for that, so is Multan. Um, but I think the Sindh Kashi is, is of course, has, uh, is, is slightly different from the one we find in Punjab. But what's important, I think, is that it shows that with, you can use crafts to provide a lifeline for communities to begin, pra begin practicing it and make it once again a part of their lives. So on the left, you see the whole monument, uh, uh, you know, when it was being conserved. On the right is the original state of, of the monument of uh, Sultan Ibrahim. So this lofty structure with the first double dome in the subcontinent dating to 16th century also carries the first example of Kashi. There's no, not been any Kashi earlier than that uh, in, in Sin. And for those not usually dealing with heritage, I just wish to quickly run through some of the work that is needed for conserving significant monuments. And we have great experts sitting here, but I just thought that for those who, not, who are not familiar with it, I'll just run through. So in the next fly, uh, slide, we'll see that there are a great number of portfolios that were developed of various studies and a lot of hard work in developing background information on the basis of which the work could be taken up. So it included historical data, significance established through cultural values of the site, as well as the monument, architectural drawings to each and every element, along with a numbering system devised for detailed reference. Incidentally, this numbering system I actually had designed or devised when I was working at the Lahore Fort. And uh, every drawing since then, I believe, actually carries that numbering system. So there's also photographic documentation and image superimposition to record its existing condition for later comparison with all the work that would be carried out. Analysis of different periods of bricks from ancient times to work done by the British and Pakistan administrations. Detailed conditions, surveys, material guidelines, dome details, as well as Kashi analysis and treatments, etc. Altogether, 500 sheets and about 20 folios. So uh, these buildings do require a great deal of studies, and, but architects, I think, are well suited to doing this. The next slide will show you how we did the test patches. This is just an example of how things were done. So if you can see that, yeah, this is just to show, we'll just run through this. Next, we'll see some examples from the folios in the next slide. 
uh, and you can see, you know, it's only a few of them. And then uh, the next one will show the Kashi treatment and uh, the protocol that we actually followed. Now you see this, this is the, a panel in which um, there are some old tiles, there are some new tiles, and a lot of it has been left as is and not actually uh, treated with replicas. We could have done it, there was no problem, the evidence was there, but uh, the whole thing was that <laughs> we needed to, we really worked at a protocol to see that we should not try to finish off everything as if it was new. So all evidence of original tiles, even disc to be maintained. So you can see where we saw, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, base of the terracotta, that was maintained. If we saw uh, the layer of uh, the mortar, we maintained that. And so the lacunae were filled by tiles only where evidence of size and pattern is available. Uh, all interventions uh, are distinguishable from the original and all interventions are actually reversible. So, uh, in fact, when we finished it, the department came and said, oh, but you haven't finished the work. And so it was with a great deal of uh, persuasion and with the, our uh, consultant from uh, uh, the State Department coming in, who'd been part of our consultative committee, Dr. Laura Tedesco, who was actually there in the November conference. And that's how we convinced them that this was the right way to go. Because normally everybody really wants to finish off everything and make it complete. So uh, now, while uh, many a time, uh, you know, we can sort of restore everything, but we try to save as much as possible of the original parts. For example, bisque or base of the glazed tile, as I mentioned, even though the tile is lost, as it adds to the authenticity of the historic structure. And also, I think it's a learning experience. So if you can see what the bisque was like, uh, you know, in the 16th century or where the mortar was, that's all original. If you were to remove it and put a new tile on it, we would have lost, a, a, you know, great value of the historic monument. Uh, I just want, wanted to point out because there are different differing ways of doing things and uh, of course we need to discuss them more and more to see what is the right way or the best way to handle something like that. Ne in the next one you'll see the images uh, after treatment of, uh, um, of Sultan Ibrahim. Uh, on the left on the top you see um, as we found them and then the bottom two uh, views show what it looked like after it was finished. We tried to make sure that we did not, even in the dome, we could have finished it actually completely, but we did not want to overdo it because then there would be a contrast between what was below and you know and what was in the dome. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard choice as to how you really finally decide. So, uh, so we just touched only those parts where evidence was available and where original material has been lost entirely. Uh, this is very important for us to determine and for that, again, you need lots of lots of studies. Now the next slide is about calligraphic panels. I wanted to show them to you because calligraphy was a very important part of uh, Sultan Ibrahim uh, monument. I just wanted to show how we transferred the different, um, um, you know, the, the different script and, and so on. And the, the Photoshop treatment had to be done. We were very lucky. We found one um, uh, almost complete panel that we found uh, you know, fragments in the other sides and we, we were able to then see that it was the same uh, Quranic verse that was repeated. And so that's how the replicas were made and they were placed to continue wherever they had been lost. Uh, uh, luckily, there was not very much left of the bisque or any other evidence. So we were able to continue and complete this because that became a very important part of the um, conservation of this important um, uh, monument. Now, I just wanted to share with you the training modules we developed at the time. Uh, these modules were later used to uh, used for training communities in adopting Kashi making. We were fortunate to have assistance from UNESCO World Heritage Center at the time due to the interest of Junihan, who was amazing. And we conducted the trainings for Kashi production. And so we developed a whole um, uh, expertise that we did not, uh, did not actually uh, have before. And that is what helped us to go into the communities and help them to start working on Kashi. Now the next one uh, shows you the, engage, the engagement with communities themselves uh, themselves, and uh, so we started off with women. On the left is the first, uh, in a sense, the first venture of, of one of the women uh, with her kids who were making these little, uh, uh, you know, pottery uh, tiles uh, after we persuaded them. This is Karima who was uh, quite uh, amazing and who's, uh, uh, you know, the one who started off the whole thing. You can see how it went on and then on the, uh, at the bottom of the slide you see how she was selling her uh, uh, stuff from the place where she used to beg from in, in Makli itself. Next, In the next slide you'll see the trainings being carried out by inviting 
mendicant communities. You can see they are mostly women. And in the next slide again, you will see how the Akashi entrepreneurs are being, uh, are being trained uh, at ZC3. Uh, this is ZC3 itself where the whole thing was, was uh, going on. In the next one, uh, we will see the products that are being made by our trained entrepreneurs. And at least two villages are now completely engaged in making terracotta or Kashi products, many earning as much as 12,000 to 15,000 rupees. And uh, so uh, this I wanted to share with you to see how uh, we can get communities to actually, uh, you know, be involved and take, a, take pride. And uh, really, uh, uh, this is the best way to safeguard our heritage. Now, uh, in the next, now, the second part of my presentation is to do with LEPI. Uh, and the potential of LEPI for rescuing historic assets. Uh, this is Architects Disaster Management Network, uh, admin uh, for heritage safeguarding in post COVID-19 world. And this is what I thought uh, we'll discuss a little bit to see how we could move on that. Uh, so, and this is a, a, also, I think it's a good point to continue the discourse that was initiated and moderated brilliantly by Benedict de Montlore uh, in the spring uh, spotlight uh, uh, of the World Monuments Fan Fund. She's the CEO in New York. And uh, last month, there was a good discussion on the whole thing regarding the impact of COVID-19 on heritage protection in which due to John's interest, discussion on Makli also took place, I wanted to inform you. This discourse is specially directed towards the work that Admin Architects Disaster Management Network could also take up. As we know, preparing for disasters for the protection of human beings is as critical as that for our heritage. So uh, this is something that Admin, I think uh, it will be very suitable organization or a, or a setup to be able to do that. So thus, uh, I would like to say that instead of uh, spending $250,000 on more Sultan Ibrahims, it would be worthwhile to consider providing first aid to perhaps 20 monuments, monuments and save them for further degradation or collapse. And so oh, I just wanted to share what, what is LEPI. Now this methodology, if we can go to the next slide, relies on various studies, uh, including uh, field inspection. As you see on the left, uh, I've put down the, whatever the requirements are, uh, the, the field inspection report, which is a FIR, a heritage evaluation documents and implementation by admin architects. That is what will be needed. And if we look at the tenets as to what they are, the principles, uh, reversibility, which is again a common one uh, when you follow charters and guidelines, uh, compatibility should be there, minimum intervention is required, do no harm is one of the most important tenets, uh, and um, uh, you know, halt further degradation so that you stop, you know, you, they don't, don't uh, um, get damaged further. Respect the age of the monuments, <clears throat> don't make it new and then use zero or low carbon materials wherever possible. For instance, earth, lime, and bamboo, and I'll show you some examples of that. So um, uh, we started off actually first by, as you see on the, on the left again, uh, Sultan Ibrahim and the, um, and the scaffolding that is made out of bamboo and uh, instead of steel. Now our uh, structural consultant who's very competent, I mean Tariq was adamant initially that it must be steel scaffolding. Luckily, we were able to convince him to design a bamboo scaffold, and that has really worked very well. It's very light. It does not damage the, uh, the heritage structure in any way at all. So uh, th this is the way we started off by, by using bamboo in, 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 in uh, trying to save, uh, uh, not, to, not to somehow damage the heritage at all. In the next slide, we'll see that the structure, which is of Samma Noble One, uh, was in a highly endangered state. As you can see, the left is the one that is actually completed. It was, com it was stabilized as a ruin. But on the, the four slides that you see on the right, you can see how badly damaged it was and the oversailing parts and how it looked as if uh, it was all going to collapse. And uh, uh, so uh, it is the bamboo supports that prevented the collapse of oversailing parts. Also, as much of the internal brick masonry had disintegrated and no evidence of any treatment could be found, the lacuna was filled in with mud brick, which has stabilized the structure. Uh, you can see um, on the four pictures the, together, the one the top uh, where the bamboo uh, supports have been used, and on the right is the original condition of the in interior of, that, of the wall, uh, which as you can see is uh, in a highly degraded state, and it was impossible uh, to see how to stabilize it. And of course, the two slides below show the condition uh, you know, after they had been stabilized. So what I wanted to say was that it is possible to use these low carbon materials in uh, trying to save heritage also. 
In the next slide, we'll see the tomb of Jan Baba, which I have actually presented before, uh, where we made the bamboo cupolas. Uh, as you see on the left, the top picture, um, the, the cupolas are not there, and then on, on the bottom, but the, the cupolas, the, only the center one was, was extant, and that we added these two cupolas on the two sides, which are made out of bamboo, and you can see how the construction took place. Uh, it's all, uh, it, they were done, the shape is exactly according to the evidence that we found uh, in the existing one, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So we, we tried to do that, but we did not actually make a stone, uh, make stone uh, replicas here. But this has uh, the bamboo uh, uh, cupolas have helped provide protection to heritage of high value, which is below, which is in the canopy, and at the same time maintaining aesthetic unity and harmony of the structure. So there are ways to use uh, these low carbon materials in heritage. And then uh, I'll just present to you very quickly the, the Ashabi Mosque, uh, which was done with the spiritual gods of South Africa. Uh, on the left, you can see what condition it was, a pretty bad state, and on the right is the uh, the, the completed one with using LEPI treatment, which means only using uh, lime and, and, and mud uh, uh, lipai and, and uh, basically mud brick for, for lacune and also bamboo wherever that, that's needed. In the next two slides, again, we'll see some more uh, on that. And uh, because of this, we, we saved the structure from collapse, while another one that was just abutting it actually collapsed in the, la in the last year's rain. So oh, there is a value in trying to protect them. And this really didn't cost very much. Uh, I think uh, probably didn't spend more than about you know, 12 or 13 lakhs on this. And uh, uh, rather than you know, very expensively um, sort of treated uh, or treatments that were, that were going to cost a lot of money. So with very little amount of money, uh, since 2012, this has really uh, you know, weathered all kinds of very aggressive kind of rains and, and, and storms as well. Uh, next slide, I think, just shows how we normally, um, I don't know if you can see the red arrows, but I can go to the next slide. It shows where, the, where the, uh, we found that there were uh, the damaged parts and how they were to be treated. So it's very quick analysis and very quick way of doing it. So uh, now we'll, I just wanted to show you very quickly how many they're only actually they're not all of them. There are some of the vulnerable monuments in Makri due to loss of roofs, uh, mainly cupolas. These require immediate help. Thus, by filling in the lacuna and masonry walls with mud brick and application of mud lime sacrificial layers for protection and exposed masonry uh, of exposed masonry, along with provision of bamboo roofs, these can all be saved from further degradation. Because I fear that if we don't do anything and we still wait for a lot of funding to come in to conserve them properly, they'll probably many of them will be gone. So there's uh, this there's tomb of Munir Makhfuri we've taken up as an example of how this could be done. And if you can see the next slide, you will see the monument, uh, which is really has the finest Kashi work, but it's, uh, most of it is now gone, it's lost, uh, because there's no roof to it and uh, it is ex the exposed to, to rain and wind constantly. And because it's on a hill, so it's even more uh, vulnerable than most, most other monuments might be. And uh, uh, so in the next slide, we show you how uh, we can actually place a temporary bamboo roof, which will provide protection to the interior of this mihrab and uh, save whatever is left. And, you know, we can treat, of course, the other uh, defects with, with again, uh, sacrificial layers of, of uh, lime and mud and so on. And so using other low cost, zero carbon treatments, the life of the monument can be extended until full conservation can be taken up. You see uh, how it can actually, it's, it's, uh, it can actually save the structure from further degradation. So now, <clears throat> these are the last of my slides. So with uh, economic downturns, it is clear the sources will be hard to come by for heritage management. In the meantime, the great treasure of heritage that exists in countries such as Pakistan, and especially in view of climate, climate crisis, are likely to become even more endangered, if not disappear altogether. I believe if Adman could take up LEPI ventures, we will be able to prolong the life of a very large number of our endangered heritage sites. By engaging communities in these initiatives, humanitarian funding could also be directed towards heritage safeguard. This is something that we should push for, that whatever funding might be available for humanitarian work, it should now also be uh, you know, put forward for heritage safeguarding where communities are engaged. So this will also open another window for architects to be engaged uh, to help save cultural heritage at the same time, ensure that communities become beneficiaries of such enterprises. I'm once again suggesting that we adopt a divergent vagabond 
pathway rather than a well-trodden avenue. So I'd like to end by quoting Robert Frost again. Two roads diverged in a wooden eye. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you so much. Thank you.